Uh, you'll notice, of course, the close similarity to Leninist ideology, to Bolshevism, which also assumes that the radical intellectuals uh, are the specialized class, the vanguard, and they've got to lead the stupid and ignorant masses to a better society. In fact, the two conceptions are very much alike. Uh, I think that's probably one of the reasons why there's been historically such an easy transition from one to another. The move from being a Leninist enthusiast to a, uh, you know, a passionate supporter of uh, uh, state capitalism and you know, working for American aims, that takes place overnight. It's been going on for years. Uh, it's called the God that failed transition. Uh, and it happens very simply. I mean, in the early stages, it had some authenticity to it when people like Ignazio Silone and others were making this transition. But in recent years, it's become just a farce, I mean, technique of opportunism. Uh, and the transition is very easy, I think, because there isn't much of a difference in ideological change. Uh, it's just a matter of where you think power lies. If you think there's going to be a popular revolution, and you can ride that revolution to state power and then wield the whip over the masses, you're a Leninist enthusiast. If you see that that's not going to happen and power lies in the state capitalist institutions which you have to serve as a manager, an ideological manager, you do that. But it's basically a very similar position. And in fact, uh, in the last century or so, since there's been a more or less identifiable secular intelligentsia, uh, I think you find typically that they fall into one or the other of these two categories. They uh, associate themselves with one or the other system of power and hierarchy uh, and uh, subordination. Uh, in fact, what I just said is almost a tautology. It's only if you submit to those systems that you're counted as a respectable intellectual uh, for obvious reasons. Well, coming up to more modern times in the post-Second World War period, uh, you find, again, a deep concern over the need to control and deceive the public, to control the public mind. Uh, presidential historian Thomas Bailey wrote in 1948, at the time when we were sort of setting off on a new war, the Cold War, he wrote, because the masses are notoriously short-sighted and generally cannot see danger until it's at their throats, our statesmen are forced to deceive them into an awareness of their own long-run interests. Deception of the people may in fact become increasingly necessary unless we're willing to give our leaders in Washington a freer hand. And uh, in 1981, as the United States was launching a new crusade for freedom, uh, Samuel Huntington, the professor of government at Harvard, uh, said in a private but published discussion, uh, an interchange, you may have to sell intervention or other military action in such a way as to create the misimpression that it is the Soviet Union that you're fighting. That's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine, which is quite accurate and gives a certain insight into the nature of the Cold War, in particular into the nature of the war against Nicaragua, which is what he specifically had in mind. Well, these concerns over uh, controlling the public mind tend to rise to the surface, particularly uh, after periods of wars and turmoil, like the 17th century revolution, the Civil War, or like the First World War, when Woodrow Wilson launched the major Red Scare, which is the major example in modern American history, of all of American history of state repression. That was really large-scale and effective in destroying unions and uh, uh, destroying independent politics and uh, eliminating independent thought and so on. And the same thing happened after World War II uh, with the uh, phenomenon that's uh, mislabeled McCarthyism. It's mislabeled because it was actually initiated by the liberal Democrats in the late 1940s. McCarthy just came along at the tail end of it and vulgarized it a little. Uh, the reason for this is, and, uh, is that uh, periods of wars and turmoil have a tendency to uh, arouse people from apathy and to make them think and to make them organize often. So that's why you get things like the Red Scare and McCarthyism uh, right after periods of war and turmoil. And the same thing happened after the Vietnam War, which had the same effect. Uh, after the Vietnam War, uh, elites were concerned about what they called a crisis of democracy. In fact, one of the most interesting books on this topic, or one of the most interesting books on, most of the insightful books, I think, on modern uh, on the modern democratic system is called The Crisis of Democracy. Uh, 
It's a study, the only book-length study, published by the Trilateral Commission. Uh, it's an important group put together by David Rockefeller in 1973, and it represents the more or less liberal internationalists from the three major centers of modern capitalism, the United States, Western Europe, and Japan, hence trilateral. And remember, this is the liberals. This is the group out of which uh, Jimmy Carter and most of his administration came. Uh, the cri what's the crisis of democracy that they're concerned with in all of the democratic societies? Well, the crisis is that uh, during the 1960s, uh, large groups of people who are normally passive and apathetic began to try to enter the political arena to press their demands. Uh, and that's a crisis uh, which has to be overcome. The, the naive might call that democracy, but that's because they don't understand. The sophisticated understand that that's a crisis of democracy. Uh, the American spokesman, again, Samuel Huntington, uh, wrote in his report that uh, Harry Truman had been able to govern the country with the cooperation of a relatively small number of Wall Street lawyers and bankers. In those days, there was no crisis of democracy. Things were working just right. But in the 1960s, you got all this turmoil. I mean, uh, young people and women and, you know, uh, uh, labor. I mean, all kinds of weird people who were supposed to be sitting quietly in the corners uh, began to get involved and caused this crisis. I mean, the same crisis that arose in the 17th century and that repeatedly arises uh, when people begin to try to take advantage of the uh, uh, formal opportunities that exist. Uh, among the terrible things that were happening during the 60s causing this crisis, they said, was that you had this group of people who they called value-oriented intellectuals. Uh, people who are concerned with things like truth and justice and all that sort of nonsense, uh, and they're opposed to the good guys, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals, they called them, the commissars, the ones who just do the job, you know. Uh, but you had these value-oriented intellectuals, and they were doing all sorts of horrible things like uh, undermine, delegitimizing the institutions that are responsible for the indoctrination of the young, like schools and universities. Remember, this is an internal discussion, so they kind of let their hair down. Uh, their general proposal at the end of all of this, these lengthy and thoughtful discussions was that what we need is more moderation in democracy to mitigate the excess of democracy and to overcome the crisis. Uh, in plain terms, what that means is that the public has to be reduced to their proper state of apathy and obedience and driven from the public arena if democracy is to survive in the appropriate sense with the specialized class, you know, the cool observers, uh, smart guys, uh, the technocratic and policy-oriented intellectuals doing our job in the interests of the people who have real power. Uh, that's the liberal side. I won't go into what the reactionary side says about the matter. Well, uh, to summarize, uh, there is a standard view of democracy uh, it's the view of Justice Powell. The public should assert, or the view that he expressed at least, the, the view that the public ought to assert meaningful control over the political process. And there's a contrary view. The contrary view is the public's a dangerous enemy, and it has to be controlled for its own good, of course, the way you control children, like you don't let a three-year-old run across the street. Now, the first view uh, is the rhetorical view now, the second view is the view that's actually held, uh, and you can see that it's actually held when a crisis of democracy erupts and the unwashed masses uh, uh, begin to try to enter into the political arena and have to be somehow repressed, either by force, as in the Red Scare, or by other means uh, uh, in order to overcome the crisis of democracy. Well, with regard uh, to the, the media play a big role in this, and with regard to the media too, there is a standard view. Uh, the standard view, for example, is expressed again by Justice Powell in the same discussion when he claims that it's the crucial role of the media to affect the societal purpose of the First Amendment, that is to it, allow the public to assert control of the political process. Standard view was also expressed by Judge Gerfine in an important decision, uh, the Pentagon Papers decision, when he permitted the New York Times to publish the Pentagon Papers. And he said, we have a cantankerous press, an obstinate press, a ubiquitous press, and it must be suffered by those in authority in order to preserve the even greater values of freedom of expression and the right of the people to know. Uh, that's one view. That's the standard view. And given that view, we then have a debate 
the debate is, uh, is over, whether the, over whether the media have gone too far in their defiance of authority and their adversarial stance. Now, uh, the right wing claims they've gone too far. They're overcome by a liberal bias. We've got to do something about it. Uh, the liberals, as in the Trilateral Commission, uh, all, in fact, agree. Uh, they, in the same study, they say that the media threaten government authority by their adversarial stance, and they've got to be curbed. If they can't curb themselves, the government is going to have to move in to curb them. Curb them. Uh, the executive director of Freedom House, Leonard Sussman, uh, asked whether free institutions must be, uh, must free institutions be overthrown by the very freedom they sustain? Rhetorical question, meaning we got to do something about uh, this excess uh, uh, freedom that the press is using to attack the government. He was writing about the uh, a Freedom House study of the coverage of the Tet Offensive, which became a sort of a classic, uh, allegedly showing that uh, uh, the press lost the war in Vietnam by uh, unfair criticism of the government during the Tet Offensive. It's an interesting, if there's no time to talk about it, I may try to get back to it. If not, maybe get to it in discussion. Very interesting study. It was total fraud. Uh, falsified the data, you know, the whole thing was faked. When you actually correct the errors, it turns out that the press, that the real charge of Freedom House was that the press, although completely supportive of the government policy and working completely within the framework of government propaganda, nevertheless was too pessimistic, they said. Uh, they didn't tell you by what standards it was too pessimistic. The obvious standard is to compare it with, say, internal U.S. intelligence assessments, which we have thanks to the Pentagon Papers. And it turns out the press was more optimistic than U.S. intelligence because they were believing the public statements and they didn't know about the private statements. Uh, so Freedom House's complaint reduces to the fact that the press uh, though, prop, though su totally supportive of the propaganda, didn't do it in an upbeat enough fashion. I wouldn't have surprised George Orwell that that should be the criticism of the press produced by an organization called Freedom House. Uh, but that's become, the, uh, uh, that's become the standard since everyone refers to that as the study that proves that the press was too adversarial. Well, uh, that's the debate. Uh, then, then the defenders of the press say, no, we're not too adversarial, or maybe we are too adversarial, but uh, you've got to tolerate us even though we're cantankerous and so on. That's essentially the issue. 